including RNA-seq, eQTL, um, animal models, and human health, and so if you can see the title, it has all the right catchphrases. In all the buzzwords I could fit right. on a slide. So. And, and also, given how fast the field is moving, I imagine you will be talking about brand new stuff. No gonads today. So, okay. if you were here for my sex determination talk in November, right. hopefully you'll enjoy this one too. All right. Okay. Um, now let's uh, welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And uh, I just want to thank, uh, you know, this is, it's been wonderful to come back. You know, you don't often get a second chance to make a first impression. And so I really appreciate um, uh, Dr. Athey for inviting me along with uh, Deb Gamuccio, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Oman. I think those are my four hosts. I'm a little disappointed you didn't get Jim Harbaugh to, to be the fifth host, but <laughs> you definitely win, <laughs> you win the contest for most hosts. <laughs> yeah, maybe he can pull me from a car or something. <laughs> uh, so uh, I am on Twitter. I try to to keep uh, to tweet about science. Feel free to tweet about this talk. It just puts more pressure on me to get this paper out quickly. Uh, but today I'm going to tell you about most of this data. It comes within the last month, and I'm you know we're just starting to get our hands around it, and I really want some input. Um, but it's from systems genetics to predictive genomics, all of the buzzwords genetic diversity, public health transform. Uh, hopefully I, I'll get to all of that. So I don't see any I don't see any twins here, which means we're all genetically unique. And that means that all of our phenotypes, eye color, height, behavior, uh, you know, genetic differences cause these differences among us. And it also, genetics affects our predisposition to disease, along with we're finding more and more uh, efficacy of drugs or toxicity or response. And so genetics plays a really important role. Now, I work in the mouse, and over the past five years, we've gotten some really bad press. And there's been a lot of talk that the mouse is a bad model uh, for studying human disease. And it turns out that there are cases where uh, certain phenotypes are not recapitulated in the mouse, and you probably shouldn't be using the mouse as a model. But in a lot of cases, it turns out that if you dig a little deeper, the mouse actually is a great model for human disease. Now, I want to tell you why I think that, you know, kind of our, the last 50 years uh, has, has kind of given the mouse a bad name. It was essential, but, you know, if we look in here, and if we start thinking about drug response, did everyone find him? Yeah? Okay, so, but what if the drug response is only affecting guys in green suit, but the whole time we've been studying it in black six mice? And so this has kind of been a necessary relationship that we've had where, you know, we have used this reference strain black six for almost all of our experiments, but this reference strain turns out to be an outlier in many cases. And so I want to convince you that the, gen that the mouse is still a great genetic model for studying disease and gene regulation, but we really have to embrace diversity going forward. And we do that starting with these eight inbred strains of mice. So these are the founder strains of the mouse collaborative cross and the population that I work on, the diversity outcross up at Jackson Lab. It includes our favorite reference, Black 6 our favorite and least favorite reference. It also includes three recently wild-derived inbred strains, uh, Castanias, PWK, WSB. If we look at the, the amount of variation in these founder strains, it's actually there's 50 million single nucleotide polymorphisms segregated. This is equivalent to more than the variation among humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. So you can think of this population as you know, almost all the genetic variation you you would ever want, probably more than you ever need. Uh, but it turns out it's a very powerful population. Ten years ago, when I was still in grad school, they were developing this collaborative cross. And so they were using these eight inbred strains to develop new inbred lines that were mixtures of all eight inbred strains. And the goal was to create a thousand of these individual lines. Now, most of them did not make it through the inbreeding process, which is, tells you really gives you a hint of how much genetic diversity is in the population that you get, you know, a lot of extinction as you try to inbreed. But now there's about 200 of these strains. These are the collaborative cross strains. And I'm not going to show you data today on these strains, but I want you to keep in mind that this 
this resource is going to be really valuable for me going forward when I make predictions that I need to test in an inbred strain background. What I've been working on is this population we call the diversity outcrop. And I say it's a design discovery population because we took these partially inbred collaborative cross lines when they were at, uh, you know, at F2 through F5 of inbreeding. And we moved them from Oak Ridge National Laboratory to Jackson Lab, where we established this outbreeding colony, where there's 175 um, breeding pairs at each generation. And we randomly outbreed uh, at each generation to accumulate more and more recombination events. What this does is it produces individual mice that are all genetically unique. They're heterozygous from the eight founders, so at any locus, seven-eighths of these mice will be heterozygous, which is closer to what you see in a human genome. You don't have that much homozygosity. And like I said, there's 50 million SNPs in this population. So if you can harness that genetic diversity, you can get at some really interesting biology. These mice are genetically unique, and they are phenotypically diverse. This is a single litter of these outbred mice. You see all kinds of phenotypes. What you don't see here is behavior. I've never been bitten so much as I have over the past three years. I mean, these guys, they're crazy. And <laughs> they also get really big. You get these really interesting phenotypes. You know, it looks, this one looks like a capybara. This is a, a female outbred mouse that's about three times the normal size of a mouse. And this is all genetics. This is a standard rodent child diet. And you can see that, you know, this is looking at weight for a bunch of these mice. This is part of a collaboration with Alan Addy and Mark Keller at University of Wisconsin. And you can see that just looking over two months, the diversity here in, in body weight, this is far exceeds the diversity that we observe in the eight founder strains themselves. So there's a lot of epistasis. There's a lot of transgressive segregation in this population. So when I started at the Jackson Lab, I came in at the perfect time because we were just finishing up this huge phenotyping study uh, on 850 of these diversity outcross mice. They were going through this phenotyping pipeline where they were uh, assessed for 140 plus uh, phenotypes. And at the end, I came in and I got the RNA-seq data from livers. And, and just recently, we've gotten protein abundance from these livers. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But we have all this other data. Um, and we're also just getting the data here from kidney. Also, when I was starting at the lab, we were starting to find ways to elucidate each individual's genome. And so we used uh, a genotyping array that we designed with 8,000 initially and then 50,000 uh, SNPs. Each run of three SNPs was designed to be able to tell you within those SNPs which of the eight founder strains that allele derived from. So we then designed a hidden Markov model. And, and then you can go through and you can impute the 36 state diplotypes, since we have 36 possible genotypes at any locus. And we can do this for every individual. We can also do association and linkage mapping using an additive model, where uh, we are imputing uh, the additive effects of all of the eight founder haplotypes for a given genotype. This becomes important later on. So here's a reconstructed diversity outcross genome uh, at, at we're at stage, uh, I guess we're at generation 17 of outbreeding now. So each of these individuals has 500 to 600 uh, recombination events. You can compare that to a standard like F2 intercross mouse where you only have about 25 recombination events. This is very powerful. You get very high resolution mapping. The problem is, is that we didn't have the methods developed to take advantage of the genetics of this population. So our methods couldn't meet our model. We had this amazing population. But when we started doing RNA-seq in the livers from these animals, and we started using existing tools and existing pipelines, what I was finding is that most of my findings were false positive. And that was really frustrating for about six months. You can ask my wife about that. Uh, <laughs> so the initial analysis pipeline, and this is still used a lot. You take your 30 million. Uh, we were using single end 100 base pair lumina sequencing. You align them to a genome or a reference transcriptome. We were aligning to the transcribed genes themselves. And then we were estimating gene and isoform expression. I'm not going to talk about isoform expression because 
100 base pair single end reads in this population, you can't get good estimates by formal expression. We've done tons of simulations. It's not going to happen. And I think that, you know, with longer paired end reads, with longer pack bio in Oxford nanopore sequences, this won't be a problem. Everything I'm telling you about in the next 10 minutes is kind of like the Model T. And I'm going to, you know, it's, it was good in 1910, but now as we get farther along, you know, it's hopefully we learn something from it. But if you do this enough, and we did this in 453 mice, and these are genetically diverse mice, you can start to look for regions of the genome that affect the expression of that gene. So these are expression QTL or EQTL. The problem is, in an ideal scenario, your genotype will be known at all loci in, this, in these mice. Every read will uniquely map to a single locus. So here I've got reads that derive from different parts of the genome. And each one I'm showing you maps to a single locus either on the maternal chromosome or the paternal chromosome. Here's a gene with three isoforms. And here the colors are for the different founders that came to that. And ideally, the count of the mapped reads will be a direct estimate of expression level. Unfortunately, none of those apply when you're working on a population like this uh, because uh, almost every single 100 base pair read is, gonna, is expected to have one or more uh, polymorphisms. And, the, and they tend to cluster, too. And so you're going to have a lot of problems. Now, the big problem is that these reads, uh, which we call multi-map reads, uh, can, you can have reads that align to multiple genes equally well. You can have reads that align to a single gene but align to multiple isoforms. So this would be an isoform multi-read. This is a gene multi-read. You also, if you want to understand allele-specific expression, you want the reads to align specifically to one of the haplotypes, so the maternal or the paternal chromosome. In most cases, that doesn't happen. Yes, hold on. This is foreshadowing. No. <laughs> but you're on the right, you're on the right track. <laughs> OK, so uh, I have, to, uh, I have to revise this estimate because I was taking a conservative estimate, but there's, a, there's actually about 50 million SNPs in this population with the latest release. There's over a million transcribed SNPs, and there's also uh, 100,000 or so insertions and 100,000 or so deletions. There's also structural variants that we're not taking into account right now. But that's a lot of variation. So I spent a year developing a piece of software that would for each individual diversity outbred mouse, we would start by genotyping them at 8,000 or 50,000 SNPs. We would run them through our hidden Markov model. We would impute the 36 state genotypes across the chromosomes. And then we could pseudophase these haplotypes based on just parsimony. So what are the minimum number of recombination events between the founder strains that could create that chromosome? Turns out it's not a big deal uh, if you make a, an error here or there, since we're going to the transcript. We were then lucky because the Sanger Center was sequencing 30 inbred strains, eight of which are the founder strains of this population. So we had full genome sequences. We knew which SNPs, which insertions, and which deletions were specific to each strain. We could then go in to our inferred uh, haplotypes, and we could start putting in each of the SNPs that were specific to that strain in that region. And so in doing so, we could build two haploid versions of the genome that were specific to that animal. Then we used a little computational trick to combine them. And then we brought in the gene and isoform annotation. And we were able to build individual transcripts, two pair, a pair of individual transcripts for each gene in the genome for each of these DO mites. So this becomes our alignment tool, our search space. The great thing is, is that we also know which founder strain each of these is derived from. So if you can, uh, if you can estimate allele-specific abundance, you can see which one is coming from B6 and what that level of expression is there. We then take our RNA-seq reads. We use a standard aligner, but we're aligning to this individualized transcriptome. It's a diploid version. And then we use an existing EM algorithm. I, I don't have time to talk about it today, but we've developed a better algorithm uh, that expands on the EM approach, but looks at splice sites. And so we're just getting to the point where we can start to look at splicing differences in this population. But what I'm going to tell you about today are our abundance estimates at the gene level and allele estimates at the gene level. 
So we did a lot of simulations first. And so we started with simulating RNA-seq reads from a diversely outbred mouse genome. We then aligned it to the mouse reference transcriptome. And then we compared it to aligning it to our individualized diploid transcriptome. We used our EM algorithm to look at gene abundance. So we could look at uh, alignment biases, and then we could look at differences in the gene abundance there. What we found is that when we align these 10 million reads, simulated reads, so we know where they come from, we align them to the reference, and then we align them to the individualized. There are five classes of alignments that a read can take. The first class is the worst class, and this is an incorrect unique read. This is a simulated read that aligns to, to a single location, but it's the wrong location. These are very bad. You don't, you want to minimize. An incorrect multi-read is not quite so bad because it aligns to multiple locations and all of them are wrong, but the amount that it, it will add to any one location is diminished, so that's not so bad. An unmapped read is an unmapped read, but if you can map those reads to the right place, you get a lot of extra information. A correct multi-read, it aligns to multiple places, but one of those is the correct location, and then a correct unique read is the most informative. This is, it aligns uniquely to a single location. What you can see is that when we compare the reads that fall in each of these classes, you see a huge bias over here for reads that are improved, their alignment improves by alignment to the diversity outbred individualized genome. In most cases, they jump two categories. So you get a lot, 138,000 reads that move from being unmapped to mapping uniquely to a single location. There's a lot of information there that you would be missing if you align to the reference transcriptome. Turns out that this makes a big difference at the gene abundance level too. Since we have our ground truth in our simulation, we can compare what are our estimates coming out of our EM algorithm and how close are they to the ground truth in the simulation. And we can look at aligned to the reference or aligned to our individualized reference genome. We can allow a certain number of mismatches. And what you find is that there are about 12,000 genes that are expressed above threshold, and about over 1,000 of them in this individual are uh, within 5% of the ground truth estimate when you align to, oops, to the DO genome compared to the reference. You'll also see that there are 1,000 uh, more genes that differ by t more than 10% um, when you align to the reference. And so this is, this is for a single animal, keep that in mind. The other th cool thing we can do with our individualized alignments is we get two estimates of gene abundance that are allele specific at every gene. So we can compare the ground truth allele frequency, so that's the percent of uh, allele one over allele two in the ground truth, and we get an estimate of allele frequency that comes straight out of our alignment. And so, in a perfect world, they would all line up uh, on the 45 degree angle, but we do a pretty good job, you know, almost you know, 0.9, and uh, this is the simulation. So what about real data? You know, I could sit up here and talk to you for hours about simulations and why I hate them, uh, but the, the proof is in the pudding. And so, this is a single DO animal where we aligned the liver RNA-seq to the reference, and then we aligned it to the individualized reference genome. And then we looked at gene abundance. And so each one of these dots is the gene abundance when you align it to the reference or to the, the DO genome. What you can see is that most of the points fall along the 45 degree line. That's good. But there are about 700 genes where the difference based on alignment search space alone is more than 10%. And when we compare these to our simulations, we find that the vast majority of these genes are improved in our simulation when you align them to the individualized reference. So 700 genes in a single animal, let's just get rid of those 700 genes, right? And then we'll just keep going with the reference. The problem is, is that each one of these individuals is going to have a different bias. They're going to have a different set of genes that are sensitive to misalignment. And, it, and if you look at a big enough population, like 453 of these animals, you're going to find that the total number of genes that are sensitive to alignment bias approaches the total number of genes in the eight founder strains that are sensitive to alignment bias. And that number is five to 7,000, depending on the tissue you're looking at. That's a, that's a lot of genes. 
is this a problem just in this mouse population? Well, I would argue it's also a problem in humans. So we took some of the Yoruban lymphoblastoid cell lines uh, from the Thousand Genomes Project, and we made, we used Signature to make an individualized reference genome, and then we compared the personalized genome estimate to the reference. This is a single uh, person's lymphoblastoid cell line. If you look at 50 of these people, you see there's a huge amount of variation. And distressingly, there's a lot of cases where when you align to the reference, it looks like a gene is not on at all, but when you align to the personalized genome, that gene is expressed and vice versa. So there are a lot of cases where the reference tells you the gene is being expressed at some high level, but when you take into account that individual's variation, that goes away and it's not expressed at all. So these are, these are problems. And we wanted to see what happens when you then go look downstream at expression QPL. And so we took all 453 of these diversity outcross mice, we aligned their RNA-seq to the reference uh, transcriptome, and then we did eQTL mapping. We then aligned it to the individualized, so 453 individual diploid transcriptomes, and then we did eQTL mapping. So in red, it's from aligning to the reference, in blue is aligning to the diploid transcriptome. The first thing we saw was that there were a lot of spurious eQTLs being assigned to pseudogenes, that when we take into account genetic variation in the parent protein coding gene, we get rid of that pseudogene, that spurious eQTL. Here's a case of RPS12 pseudogene 2. It's over here on chromosome 14 in the mouse. It has this very strong distant eQTL that maps to 10. And when we look under this region, lo and behold, the parent protein coding gene ribosomal protein 12 is sitting there. When we look in detail further, there are reads that derive from this, this gene that contain SNPs that are shared in the Castaneous and the PWK founder strains. And when those reads have that SNP variation and you align them to a reference, they look like they're coming from the pseudogene. So they're being misassigned to the pseudogene. What this does is it makes it look like this pseudogene has an eQTL over here where the animals that are cast in PWK in this region are expressing this, when in fact, those reads should have been assigned over here. When you take into account the individual variation and you assign them to the correct place, you lose this pseudogene um, association. What you also lose is there's association I'm not showing you. You also have an association, a spurious local association for the protein coding gene, because those reads that were coming from cast in PWK were being sent to the pseudogene and it looked like this gene was lower expressed in Cas and PWK. And so one misalignment was causing two spurious eQTL associations. This was a problem. We got rid of most of these. What we didn't expect to see is that when you take into account individual genetic variation in your alignment, you uncover a vast amount of real local genetic regulation. This is confounded or masked when you align just to a reference transcriptome because you're getting rid of, you're not going to map the reads that contain those interesting SNPs. You know, you're looking at the least common set of reads. And so here's a case with heme binding protein 1. It's located over here in chromosome 6. When you align to the reference, you get a small bump, but it's not above significance. When you take into account the individual genetic variation, you see there's a very strong local eQTL. 3,000 genes in our population we uncovered local eQTL only after doing this. This has a big effect when you're looking at human eQTLs and you're trying to say, oh, I have a GWAS hit over here. This region has 100 genes. I'm going to look for cis eQTLs and see if that's likely. To... You're going to be missing probably in the human 10 to 15% of those are not going to have eQTLs when you should. Keep that in mind. We worried a bit that you know, no one's going to believe that there are 3,000 hidden eQTLs. <laughs> Luckily, with this population, we have a lot of alternative sources to validate it. And so here's a long non-coding RNA, GM12976. It has a strong local eQTL on chromosome 4, only when you align to the individualized genome sequences. When we zoom into this region of chromosome 4, and we pull out the additive effects of each of the four founder strains, and we can map them on that region, what you see is that only animals that derive that long non-coding RNA from the 129 founder strain have increased expression of that long non-coding RNA. We can then go look in the founder strains themselves 
And so we had liver RNA-seq from the eight founder strains. And you can see that only the 129 founder strain is expressing that, that long non-coding RNA. We can go one step further because in our DO population, we're aligning to two versions of every transcript that are tagged by the founder. We can pull out those allele estimates and we can just say which allele estimates from which founder and how are they expressed for this long non-coding RNA. Only the alleles in the DO that are derived from the 129 founder are expressed. This is a, this is a cis trans test. This is telling us that this is local genetic variation that's acting in cis only on the 129 allele. Turns out that if you have genetic variation and you can measure allele specific expression, you're going to see it. So allelic imbalance is the rule rather than the exception. You know, in our population, whenever we have enough SNPs where we can actually measure allele specific expression, we see it. We see it in every tissue we look. And we see a lot of interesting patterns here too. And this is actually important for the next step because we're not looking at a single SNP, right, where there's only A, B, or HET. And so we have this huge liver transcriptome where we had 21,000 genes that were expressed above threshold. And for 11,900 of them, we mapped a significant EQTL. So each dot is an EQTL where the X coordinate position is the position of the peak SNP for that EQTL. And the Y coordinate position is the position of the gene itself. And so you'll see this line here, which is actually 10,000 local EQTL. So these are uh, EQTL that map within plus or minus five megabases of the gene that they encode. We also have uh, about 1,700 distant EQTL. And so these are prob these are cases where you have uh, an interaction of some sort between a regulator that's at the distant locus and somehow that's affecting uh, the gene, uh, the RNA abundance. So these, this is what you use to build networks. We've had a hard time finding the genes in this region, but I'm not gonna dwell on that because I think it's, I'll get to the protein where we've had better, <laughs> better uh, So the great thing is, is we can actually use these eight founder strains uh, to help us get to what are the actual variants that are affecting expression. You now there are 127 different ways these eight founder strain patterns can partition into two alleles. And if you have a case where you have, you know, one, two, nine, <laughs> so this, you know, this is saying that the founder strains one, two, nine and NZO are probably different from the others. There might be something weird going on with this other one. So you look for the SNPs in that region of the gene that match that pattern where the genotype of 129 and the NZO differs from the other. And in many cases, you can go from regions where you have 50,000 SNPs to 20 or 10. There are cases where we can get down to a single SNP that matches the pattern that's expected in our RNA-seq allele estimate. This is a really great way. I was talking uh, with Alan earlier about how we can maybe use some of his methods to help us take that set of 20 and find the ones that are most likely to be positive. So conclusions, part one, alignment is critical, especially when you're working with genetically heterogeneous mice or humans. Hopefully you're working with genetically heterogeneous humans. I don't think we have any clones here, but <laughs> it's critical not only for read alignment, it's critical for gene abundance, it's critical for EQTL mapping. If you're not aligning to individualized sequences, you're missing you know, up to a third of your EQTL. Reference alignment masks those because it's just picking the reads that are like the least common set. Most EQTL are local and we can prove that they act in cis on a single allele, not both. We can use those 127 distinct patterns to start to figure out which SNPs are most likely or which indels. We can go in and look at indels as well. Distant EQTL, they're very important for network construction and I'm, I'm interested in, in understanding gene networks. Uh, but, you know, aside from a few cases, they've resisted identification. Okay, so, but how does this relate to protein, right? I mean, our cells are not built by RNA, our cells are built by proteins. And there's been a huge controversy for the past probably 20 years since we've been able to measure protein and, and transcript abundance. Uh, you know, how much does transcript abundance translate to protein abundance? And so in, in 2013, the first um, 
genetic analysis of protein abundance came out of Mike Snyder's group, uh, Wu et al. And this was in Nature, and they said, we estimate that approximately one half of protein abundance, or PQTLs, are probably, probably also EQTLs. This is what you say when you're not sure uh, and your statistics are great. Um, but however, many PQTLs do not correspond to EQTLs, even when they relax the stringency. So, you know, even if you'd set your false discovery rate at 90%, you're still not seeing any. Now, later, this is just uh, five or six months ago, in Cell, a group working in a, a mouse population uh, that doesn't have anywhere near the genetic diversity we do, this is Rudy Abersall's group, they reported in Cell that protein and mRNA gene products generally do not correlate, and most transcript and protein QTLs do not overlap. And then just a few weeks ago, Yoav Galad and Jonathan Pritchard's group at Chicago and Stanford reported uh, in science that QTLs affecting mRNA levels are on average attenuated or buffered at the protein level, which led to Yoav Galad, who's very um, active on Twitter, uh, saying, I'm now convinced that protein expression is often buffered against regulatory variation at the mRNA level. Mechanism unclear, though. In the last month, I figured out the mechanism, and I'm really excited to, to share this with you today. I think I figured it out. I can't say for certain. I've only had it for a month. But so we were lucky enough to start a collaboration with one of the leaders in the proteomics field, Stephen Gigi at Harvard Med. He has a talented postdoc, Joel Chick, that I've been working with uh, and talking to five or six times a day over the last six months. We decided that this would be a great population to do a combined EQTL and PQTL analysis. So we took 194 of these diversity outcross mice where we had uh, RNA seq, uh, RNA seq for the liver. We took part of that liver, we sent it down to Harvard, and they lysed it, trypsinized it, uh, labeled it with an isobaric tag, multiplexed it, and then did LC MSMS. And they were able to quantify. 1,855,000 peptides. Now, I'm not a protein person, but I've heard this is a lot more than has been done in the past before. We were able to quantify 8,687 proteins in this population that were present in half or more of the samples. Most of these proteins, we had three to seven peptides in that protein that we could quantify. And what, we ha what happens when we take those protein levels and we look for regions of the genome that affect the abundance of those proteins is we see a similar pattern in our proteome map. So for 8,509 proteins, we were able to detect 1,660 PQTL, which is 10 times more than these previous studies were able to detect. And again, most of them were local, so they uh, map to the same location in the gene. These are likely to be cis-acting PQTL. And then we had about 500 that did not map to the same region of the gene. When we compared this to our EQTL set, the first thing we noticed was very striking. 92% of genes that had a local PQTL, so they had a local uh, region of the, uh, a local polymorphism that affected protein abundance, they had a matching EQTL. So this has not been reported before. It turns out that for this subset of 1,000 genes, if you know the transcript abundance for that gene, you pretty much know the protein abundance. And here you can see that you know, we have correlations up to you know, 0.95. And so here's you know, 176 diversity outbred mice. This is liver transcript abundance compared with protein abundance. And here you have each individual. And you can see there's a very strong linear correlation. When we look at the EQTL map and the PQTL map, you see that they match. When we zoom in on that region where the PQTL is, Here's the PQTL. Now we're looking at the eight founder effects there. You can see that the, the animals that derive this from PWK have higher expression. When you look at mRNA, you see the exact same pattern. This is a little noisier just because you know, we can't measure protein abundance as, as well as we can RNA. But we can tell pretty much that this transcribed variation that's affecting RNA abundance is being translated to the protein level. Now, where are the red dots off the axis, off the diagonal? This is what Yoav was getting at. So it looked like protein levels for all of these genes, except for four of them, 
were uncoupled from transcript abundance differences for those genes. So here we have 500 distant eQTL, and only four of them overlap, have a distant eQTL at the same spot. These are actually likely, <laughs> we found to be mapping problems where our gene annotation was wrong in one, of, one or more of the founder strains. Uh, and so it turns out we had to find a way to figure out what are the most likely regulators in those regions that are accounting, that are mediating that effect. And so I developed a conditional scanning approach that's similar to mediation analysis. And you start with your main scan of your PQTL. So here's a case of gene we know nothing about. It's a transmembrane gene. It's over here on chromosome 3, but it has a very strong PQTL on chromosome 13. So we can say there's a QTL in 13. It affects the protein abundance in blue of CMEN68. I then go in to this region of chromosome 13, and I pull out all of the proteins within plus or minus five megabases in that region. And since I have 8,000 proteins here, I then take each one of those proteins in the region, and I include it as an, a covariate in my mapping model. And so I'm still mapping the PQTL of TMEM68. But in each case, I'm looking, if I take that protein abundance as a covariate, does it abolish this QTL? And if it abolishes that QTL, it's telling me that this is the most likely mediator of this QTL interaction. Well, it turns out that in many cases, you can go through all the proteins in that region, add them individually as a covariate, and one of them will completely abolish the LOD score in your QTL. In this case, it's NNT, a nicotinamide nucleotide transferase. I can do the same thing with RNA. I can go into all and pull out all of the genes for which I have transcript abundance, and I can add that in my model. And again, NNT pulls out. So transcript abundance of NNT seems to be mediating this PQTL for TMEM68. We can infer this causal chain where the QTL affects the NNT RNA which is translated to the protein level, and then protein level is affecting TMEM68. So we knew nothing about TMEM68, but I can tell you that it's probably tightly interacting with NNT at the protein level. Now, keep in mind, I also have all these gray circles here. So not only can I look in that region, but I can look at all 8,000 proteins and include each one as a covariate in my model. This can be computationally expensive, but if I just focus only on that peak SNP, and I'm only regressing on that peak SNP, it's really quick. I mean, this is a, you know, this takes about two minutes to do 8,000. And what this gives you is this gives you a background level of what are the LOD scores that aren't associated with that region. And this allows you to set some Z threshold for significance. So NNT, it turns out that we rediscovered a known deficiency in the black six mouse strain. Did you know that? Yeah, so this is a mitochondrial gene. We look in this region, so NNT has a, a local eQTL. It looks like only the animals that are black six in that region have no expression of NNT. We can look in this region, we find a short, it looks like in, in the mouse genomes database, it looks like an insertion in all of the strains that are not the reference, but that's a deletion in the reference strain. This is a known deletion in an exon in black 6 that abolishes the expression of this, uh, this proton transporter that's, uh, that's uh, important for NADPH production. It was known. We didn't know it, but it, it came out of our analysis as well. We're also able to say that TMEM68 is likely to be involved in this pathway in some way in the mitochondria. So I can then go in and check and see, is TMEM68 binding to NNT? Is it in the mitochondria? These are some things that we're doing right now. What I didn't expect to find is this. So when I do my background scan, in some cases I started seeing that there were other genes, there were other circles in the background that, that didn't map to that interesting region, but where when you would include that as a covariate, you would lose your LOD score. And so it turns out that these are complex proteins and not that they're complicated, but that they're proteins that bind in complexes. Here's the chaperonin. So these are um, the 
It's the ring of eight proteins uh, that's right outside the ribosome and helps fold uh, newly translated proteins into their correct three-dimensional structure. And it turns out that when you look at one of these members, CCT7, and you look at its PQTL, CCT7 is over here on chromosome 6. It has a very strong distant PQTL on chromosome 5. We do our mediation analysis, and what we do is we find that another one of those ring members, CCT6A, the protein abundance of that uh, is highly correlated with the protein abundance of CCT7. When we go and do the background, what we find is that every single member of that complex uh, pulls out of this analysis. The other thing we can do is we can start to identify new members that are, are, are proteins of unknown function that are likely to be members of complexes just based on this analysis. When we go look at the transcript level, so even though each of these proteins is coming down, when we look at the transcript level, only CCT6A is, is knocking out that log score for CCT7. We can look at every other member of this complex and you see the exact same pattern where at the protein level they're highly correlated, but at the transcript level, only CCT6A is accounting for the abundance of those proteins. So what is special about CCT6A? These are all of the other proteins in that complex. Well, if we look at CCT6A, it has a local PQTL. And it looks like the animals that derive that gene from NOD, the NOD strain, have low expression of CCT6A protein. When we look at the transcript level, you see it's much cleaner, and you also see that the animals that are NOD in that region have much lower expression of CCT6A transcripts. We can go further because we have allele estimates, and so we can show that not only is that local, but it's also cis-acting, so only the CCT6A uh, alleles from NOD are low expressed at the transcript level. So if we look at another one of the proteins in that complex, if we look at its abundance and we compare it to its own RNA, we see what Yoav Galad saw. They're not, they don't seem to be correlated at all. But when we look at that protein's abundance relative to the protein abundance of CCT6A, that other complex member, they're highly co-regulated. And when we look and compare the protein abundance of CCT3, to the RNA abundance of that regulator, you can still see they're pretty highly correlated. And so you have said, I'm now convinced that protein expression is often buffered against regulatory variation at the mRNA level. We saw this. The mechanism is unclear, though. Well, it turns out that the mechanism is stoichiometric. We're calling this stoichiometric buffering. This is the post-translational mechanism that regulates protein abundance. So if we think of our complex, our chaperonin complex, and there are all eight members here. All eight of these, all seven of these, have a distant PQTL that maps to the region of CCT6A on chromosome 5. CCT6A has a, a local PQTL. It also has a local EQTL that we know is cis-acting. And so the, the thought, our thought, is that CCT6A has a mutation in the nod uh, cis regulatory element in NOD that is adversely affecting the transcript abundance of CCT6A. That is being translated to lower abundance of CCT6A protein, and that sets the limiting reagent in the complex abundance for all the other proteins. This is why I'm calling it stoichiometric buffering. So, what's so special about CCT6A? Nothing really. The only thing special is that it acquired a mutation that negatively affected its transcript and protein levels. And we hypothesize that any protein could be the regulator if it acquired a mutation that knocked down its protein abundance below the level of CCT6A currently in NOD. And so mutations that increase transcript or protein abundance in these other complex members are buffered or attenuated by the limiting reagent, which is CCT6A protein. We can think of this, you know, I, I'm only very recently coming into the protein world, but it seems to me that protein abundance is, um, it's, it has different rules as opposed to transcript abundance. 
So if we think of a transcriptional response in time, when we have a lightning bolt, a stimulus, transcription seems to be a pretty quick, primarily active uh, mechanism. So it's an activation mechanism. But once it reaches the ribosomes and starts being translated, any of those proteins that are going to have hydrophobic patches that it, it's required to bind in complex, those have to be bound pretty quickly to be stabilized. So the abundance of that is stable. And it turns out that there's a huge selection pressure to get rid of any unbound proteins quickly because if you don't get rid of them quickly, you get aggregation and you come, you get disease. We see this a lot. So this seems to make sense to me. I don't know about you. There's actually been some evidence in disease literature for this mechanism. So here's uh, the dystrophin glycoprotein complex. All of these, uh, dystrophin and the core complex, uh, they seem to be tightly, uh, tightly in complex, they co-IP together. And if you mutate any one of these, you get a dystrophin, or you get a dystrophy like phenotype. You also, if you mutate one and it lowers the protein abundance, there's some literature that shows that other members uh, are, the protein abundance of the other members goes down as well. You can also think of a heterodimer. There's some literature where if you have a mutation in one of the, um, the bind, so the, the domain that binds the other heterodimer, it actually causes the abundance of the other heterodimer member to go down as well. We've looked in the kidney now. This same mechanism applies. This, it appears that this is a general mechanism where the lowest amount of protein in that complex sets the upper bound for the other protein members. And any genetic variation that affects the other members uh, in a positive way seems to be buffered because of that limiting reagent. Can we use this? And so this is looking ahead a bit, but can we exploit this stoichiometric buffering to tune the levels of protein complexes? And so what I didn't tell you is I think I found the, uh, the polymorphism in NOD that affects, that causes this. And so this is uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism, it's a transversion, a G to T transversion, 200 bases upstream of the transcription start site uh, of CCT6A. This is found right smack dab in the middle of a KLF4 binding site in the active promoter. This promoter uh, is identified as an active promoter in every cell type it's been looked at. So it seems to be highly conserved from MEFs to embryonic stem cells. And, uh, Hopefully, Alan will tell me if, if this is, is actually the one. But we're, we're trying to uh, use some luciferase assays right now to show that it's the one. This is two weeks old. Uh, now that, so can we co-opt this complex? Can we move the regulation from CCT6A to CCT5? And so using what I know about this, I'm hoping to put in a mutation that will adversely affect the transcript abundance of CCT5. And then by doing so, can I affect the CCT5 protein abundance and cause it to be below the level of CCT6A protein in NOD? And if so, it should transfer the regulatory role for this complex from CCT6A to CCT5. Right? I will pull it up. I mean, that's going to work. It's on the slide. <laughs> so, in conclusion, most, so Yoav Galad uh, and, and everyone else that looked at it, they've been half right. You know, for most genes, they were wrong about this they, because they couldn't measure to the resolution that we could. You know, for most genes with local PQTL, you have concordant EQTL. So knowing, if we know the transcript abundance for those genes, we have a pretty good idea what the protein abundance is in the liver. Most genes with distant PQTL do not have corresponding distant EQTL. And so for these genes, protein level is buffered against local genetic variation. And I developed a novel conditioning method that's also it's a form of mediation analysis that allowed me to identify candidate regulatory proteins for these distant PQTL. And I could also find transcripts underlying those distant PQTL. And I also used this strategy to elucidate hundreds of genetic and or protein interactions. So I've been able to place genes of unknown function into known complexes and known pathways. And in the process, I think we uncovered 
a new post-translational mechanism for buffering of protein abundance against transcriptional delays. We see it in the kidney. We're doing heart next. Hopefully, uh, this will hold, but we're calling this stoichiometric buffering. And it's, uh, we haven't submitted the manuscript yet, so if you have a better word for this, you know, better term, please let me know. Uh, and how can we apply this knowledge to human health? Well, I have some ideas. You know, so we've been able to find all of these complexes based on this strategy. Many of these were known complexes, like the chaperonin. So in yellow are known complexes that we've also pulled out using our strategy. I have two minutes, good. Uh, these are unknown interactions. We find a lot of unknown, you know, previously unannotated interactions. Well, it turns out we have 500 of these distant PTPL, and for about 200 of them, I can find the best candidate in that region, the best candidate protein. I can identify the genes in the background that are most likely to be binding partners or in complex with that gene. And you can basically build your own gene regulatory network this way. We can go one step further, not, not just single complexes, we can use this information to get higher order network structure. So here's a case, we can pull out the endosome network, the, uh, the subnetworks involved in the endosome. And we can look and use a pathway-centered approach. And so if we look at tamoxifen metabolism, for example, we know that we have strong PQTLs for many of the enzymes in this process. And we also have these collaborative cross strains. And so what we can do is we can go in and we, can, we have the genomes for these collaborative cross strains. We can look at all of these strains. We can look at all the genes in this pathway for which we have PQTL. And we can predict which ones will have a positive or negative response. And in so doing, we can find which strains are likely to have the highest or lowest metabolism of tamoxifen. So we can start to develop new models for drug development that are based on actually predictive genomics. And we're testing these right now. So we've tested a subset of four of these. And it looks like it works, believe it or not. The other cool thing we have is Pharmaco. That's where the money comes. Yeah, the, uh, we can also use CRISPR, right? So if you can find the strain that's closest to be, you know, to be nearest to that threshold, you can then predict which types of mutations will actually push it past the threshold. So you know, that's another thing that, that we're very lucky. Uh, so I just want to uh, end by thanking, you know, we've had an amazing collaboration of people, uh, and I've been really lucky to help lead this project. Gary has been an amazing mentor. I've had a lot of help from Alyssa Chesler at the lab. This is the Jackson Lab. You know, we go hiking uh, in the summer for lunch at the ocean. It's very beautiful. I invite all of you to come up and visit. We have a great uh, bunch of short courses there. This has been a great collaboration that I'm going to continue with Joel Chick. He's also getting ready to go out on the market. And so I hope to do this sort of integrative proteomics and expression uh, analysis in other tissues. And with that, I just want to thank you for your time and for staying awake after lunch. Appreciate it. Hold on just one second. Go ahead. I'm finding out right now. I'm doing a co-IP and trying to figure out if it actually binds NNT. So the great thing about having this prediction is that I can look in black 6 liver and I can look in any other strain liver and black 6 is essentially acting as a, a null mutation for NNT so I can show that it's not binding in black 6 but it is binding in the other. Yeah. Wait, Gil was. Yeah. So a couple of comments. First, this is a tremendous body of work and a generation of input to create these uh, crosses. Um, on the correlation between RNA and protein abundance and variation. There are different groups disagreeing about this in the proteomics side. Uh, Ebersold, I think, has found a lot of differences. There's another big group I don't think you mentioned. There's Ulin yeah. in uh, no Ulin in uh, Sweden. This is the Human Protein oh, Atlas based upon antibody profiling, to which they, in recent years, have added extensive transcript analysis. They claim very high correlations. And it might be worth looking at that if you haven't Absolutely. already. The other thing I wanted to ask, that's just a comment. The question is, unless you've done that, I is, uh, you mentioned several times isoforms. We're very interested about splice isoforms here. Yeah. 
Maybe we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, uh, but we're also interested in amplicons. So this is a form of uh, cis co-expression. And I wonder if any of your findings are influenced by amplicons in some of the regions of those chromosomes. I, I think it's really interesting. And we haven't included CNVs because our understanding of copy number variants in these strains isn't complete. Uh, I do know Jake Mueller in, in HG is doing a lot of amplicon work. Um, and I think it's very interesting. But I think I'm not sure if this is the right data set to do that. Splicing and isoforms, I think we can get a lot from this data. Uh, the problem is, is in all the simulations we've done uh, on the transcript level, 100 base pair single end sequencing does not give us good isoform estimates. We're trying to uh, get a more accurate representation uh, by doing an EM looking at individual splice junctions, uh, but I don't want to make a promise about that. I think we may need to wait for the next generation of long transcript sequences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, it's just expensive. You know, the, a lot of this work, you can't really do it on just an R1. You have to be part of a big consortium. The protein stuff, uh, you know, we can capture all known protein isoforms in our polypeptide database. And, and, you know, they seem to be pretty consistent, where if you have a local PTCL, it affects all isoforms of that protein. But we may not just, we, you know, our proteins you know, analysis of protein um, or quantitation is still kind of in its infancy with the shotgun proteomics. And we're aligning to a reference database of, poly, of peptide sequences. So now we're trying to incorporate all of the coding variation, the non-synonymous coding variation in this, in this population into our search space for the polypeptides and, and the peptides, and then use that to get allele-specific estimates of protein abundance. So I think we'll have that in the next month or two. It'll be ready. I, I have actually two questions. One is when you when you have you, you said when you have one like the CCT6, I believe, uh, sort of becoming the limiting factors, you cannot determine any other factors, any other regulatory right. network in the other proteins, and you were proposing to disturb that by adding one of the factors. But can't you just mathematically take out the CCT6 effect and then look at the remaining mice that don't have any B6, and there may be something that you can uncover. Just like in GWAS, you make a conditional yeah. analysis where you put one SNP in and say, OK, is there something yeah. left at a lower threshold once you've taken a, 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 a account of one of them? I think it's a good idea. We haven't done it mm -hmm. yet. You know, this is a month old. OK. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, like taking the gene type of APOE when you're looking at G, you know, yeah. Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great idea, and I'll get back to you soon. With it. And the other question I have is, is sort of, in the old, earliest EQTL literature, it was always postulated that the trans effects would be like transcription factor master regulators yeah. that regulate hundreds and thousands of Not genes. True. So are you basically saying that all of this is, that there isn't much of this sort of trans due to transcription factors that a lot of it has to do with protein interactions? Or, I mean, this, this is, you're not well, mentioning transcription okay, factors so at all. I'm being selective. And so I haven't had time to go in the opposite direction yet. You know, this, these interviews take a lot of time out of your <laughs> <laughs> But what I've been wanting to do is because we have the protein data, we can take our EQTL data and use the protein in our mediation analysis. That should pull out the transcription factors that affect transcript abundance. But in the case of protein EQTLs, those that don't match uh, the, uh, sorry, the PQTL that doesn't match the EQTL, that doesn't seem to be transcription factors. It seems to be complexes. Cart. Um, I don't know. Maybe I missed something. But uh, I love DO mice. But I was looking at this data and I was thinking that couldn't you do the same thing in collaborative cross mice, basically? Yeah, Having you, the, you know. You could. You would need a lot more mice. You know, if our, if our measurements of protein abundance were, were any noisier, it would be better to do this analysis in the collaborative cross where you can replicate within strain. That's what I was thinking, yeah. because those mice, you know, but everyone is different. But the thing is, we get so much more um, variation in protein levels and transcript levels in these diversity outbred, these outbred animals, than you'll ever see in the collaborative cross. And the reason is, is that 
the collateral cross that would have had those protein abundance levels, they went extinct. They, did, they don't last. So we have this discovery population that we can then go back to the collaborative cross and we can predict crosses of those inbred strains that are likely to produce animals that are similar. Yeah. Great work, Stephen. Um, Thank you. So you did the analysis on liver, and so liver is, is kind of, it, under normal circumstances, unless you cut half of it out, doesn't really turn over very much. Yeah. And so protein stability is, it has to be a really huge thing in the yeah. regulation of, of what all, all the complexes is in the, pro, in the liver. What about something either like developing liver, where you would have replication, or yeah. um, even better, maybe, intestine? Yeah, well, <laughs> we can talk about intestine. I've actually thought about um, not developing liver, but liver that's undergone injury. So partial hepatectomy. Partial hepatectomy, and then getting protein abundance before and then seven days after. This population, we could do this very easily. Yep, it just takes money. You know, this, I can tell it you that. It takes a lot of operations, too. Yeah, I can tell you that this, this stoichiometric buffering appears to be happening uh, in the kidney. You know, these are adult kidneys, but we're also looking at multiple um, ages for these kidneys and seeing some differences. And so, you know, I think this could be involved in aging. How well can you control protein levels using this mechanism? And so looking at that as a possible, uh, you know, source of, of discovery. Uh, so looking at this from an evolutionary perspective, um, with these 400 and so DO mice, have you found any or looked at any alleles that are never found together within a single animal? You know, we haven't done that. There's indirect evidence that that's occurring. Um, and because there seems to be both large differences in litter sizes in this population, we also do see some um, uh, sex chromosome non-disjunction that is you know, suggesting there's some incompatibilities. What I haven't showed you is that there's this region of chromosome 2 where even though we're randomly outbreeding these animals, for some reason the WSB allele there is becoming fixed. And this was uh, finally elucidated by Fernando Cardo Manuel de Viena's group at UNC. This is kind of a proto centromere that causes that any, uh, any uh, chromosome 2 that has that WSB allele seems to be preferentially selected during meiosis. I mean, there, you know, every rule is violated in this population, but it also, because of that, we get to see new parts of gene regulation that we couldn't see just looking in a human lymphoblastoid cell line. Last Here. question. Hello, uh, great talk. Um, I have a methodol prote proteomics methodology question, uh, and it might be more for your collaborator, actually. But, um, we could call him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but routinely, if there are shared peptides between yeah. members of a protein family that are highly homologous, uh, they're just shared between them, basically. And yeah. so the, the form of the concern is that there's some autocorrelation in protein estimation yeah. between very homologous So proteins. I was really worried about this initially when I first started seeing this. And we went through these complexes and looked at the individual peptides. And luckily, in this, in this population, there's enough genetic variation where we can actually see that you know, individual peptides are being assigned to the right one. And you know, there, I think on the methodology, there's still a lot to be done. So if you're interested in a postdoc, no. <laughs> I had lunch with him, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> we have similar interests. But thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.